There are a lot of hockey leagues out there, and to a new or casual fan, it might seem like a convoluted mess of a bunch of acronyms that makes no sense. Why is one of the players of a team playing over here, another one over there? My team just drafted two different players, and now they're playing against each other. And honestly, a lot of times it is a convoluted mess. Just ask Shane Wright about the year after he was drafted, if you ever run into him for some reason. So with that being the case, I figured it was worthwhile to spend at least a little time clearing that up to some extent anyway. Now, the purpose of this video is to be a high-level overview of these different leagues, so we're not going to go too in-depth with each one. There are quite a few to get through, and we're not going to get through every league across the world, especially not your local beer league. We're going to focus mostly on the ones that have some effect on the NHL, since that is the focus of the series, getting newer fans more acquainted with the NHL and making it easier to watch and follow. And what the heck with that, we might as well start right off at the top with the NHL itself. Founded in its current form in 1918, it is a 32-team league, at least right now anyway, that plays an 82-game season, and it is the best hockey league in the world that attracts the best talent from across the planet. Well, mostly just North America and Europe, because that's where it's really played, but anywhere that someone does play hockey, the NHL is the ultimate goal if they want to make it all the way to the top. Anyway, though, we can probably move on from the NHL since, let's face it, you're probably not watching this video if you haven't at least heard of the NHL and know something about it. Up next, though, just under the NHL, we have the AHL, or the American Hockey League, which founded in 1936. It is, at least at this point anyway, the highest level minor league pro hockey league in North America, and serves as, if you're familiar with baseball at all, essentially a AAA to the NHL, with 32 teams, and while it hasn't always been this way, currently every NHL team has an affiliate team in the NHL, where they send players down to if they're not performing well enough or call players back up from if they need to fill spots on the roster due to an injury or whatever reason they might have. And also similar to AAA in baseball, it's easier with some AHL teams just based on the name and logo of the team to figure out who their NHL affiliated team is, but they all do have those affiliated teams and all 32 of them at the end of the year play for the Calder Cup just like the NHL plays for the Stanley Cup. Now, to be clear, the Calder Cup is different than the Calder Trophy awarded to the Rookie of the Year in the NHL, if you're familiar with that, having watched, I don't know, either the NHL or my video on the trophies. But yeah, Calder Cup of the AHL, completely different from the Calder Trophy that goes to the Rookie of the Year in the NHL. And real quick, one more thing. Well, again, it hasn't always been this way with the AHL. The game is currently pretty similar to that of the NHL, obviously not quite as fast and high skilled as the NHL since all the best players for the most part are playing up in the NHL, but the AHL still has roughly the same number of goals scored per game. In fact, this last season, the 23-24 season, as I filmed this the summer of 2024, the goals for per game in the NHL versus the AHL were almost exactly the same. So because of all that, as well as obviously its proximity to the NHL, the AHL is at least certainly arguably the next best league in the world when it comes to hockey talent. The only other leagues that I think you could even consider being the next best to the NHL would be the KHL, which for a long time was seen as that, the Russian Pro League, which we'll get to in a little bit. And then there's a couple of other leagues over in Europe, Pro Leagues in Sweden and Finland that are also pretty talented as well as Czech, but we'll get to those in a little bit. We'll move on from the AHL to the next league below it, the essential double A for the NHL and even brands itself that way sometimes, the ECHL. Founded in 1988, the ECHL or East Coast Hockey League is a now 29 team league, soon to be anyway, of which 26 teams have NHL affiliates already locked in, though that is likely to grow. Eventually, this will probably be a fully fledged 32 team league, all of which having NHL affiliates, at least until the NHL expands again, which is a whole separate issue for another time. But at least for now, the majority of teams, the vast majority of NHL teams, have an ECHL affiliate. Now, like the AHL, but even more so with the ECHL, not all of the players that are playing on the affiliated teams have contracts with the NHL team. In fact, most of the teams have fewer players that are actually signed by the NHL affiliate than aren't. So a lot of these guys are brought in by the ECHL team as free agents signed by the ECHL team specifically. Either way, it doesn't necessarily mean that every player playing on the ECHL or even AHL team have contracts to eventually move up to play with the NHL team. But anyway, that's probably getting more complicated than we need to for right now. If you're a new NHL or hockey fan in general, all you really need to know about the ECHL is that it is essentially the double A for the NHL. It's still a pro league with no age requirements or anything like that. Oh, and since I forgot to mention it, though, I'll try to have it up on a graphic or something so you've probably already seen it. The ECHL and AHL both play 72 game seasons, so 10 fewer games during the regular season than what the NHL plays 
though at least the AHL has potentially a much more extended playoff, but still slightly fewer games being played at these pro levels than the NHL. Still, these 72 games are the most games being played in any hockey league aside from the 82 played in the NHL. Moving on now from the ECHL, though staying in North America, we're going to shift from the pro leagues where there are no age restrictions to the major junior leagues where there often are age restrictions. Usually players have to be between 16 and 20 or 21 depending on the league with some exceptions that can be made on either end that we're not going to bother getting into that. The point is these are leagues meant for younger players to develop and get ready to be drafted as this is also where we switch from where players often get sent after being drafted to where players get drafted from. Now with that being said, players still often will get drafted especially after the middle point of the first round, get drafted out of these major junior leagues and then get sent back to that team to develop there, it's just that the NHL team who drafted them now owns their professional rights once they're ready to make that jump or age out of these junior leagues. And of course, when it comes to major junior hockey in North America, it makes sense to start with the CHL, which confusingly is actually just a governing body over three different major junior leagues, the OHL, WHL, and QMJHL, which are more often what get referred to when talking about where a player is getting drafted from, going to play, or was playing. Regardless, you usually hear specifically what league a player is playing in, but sometimes you'll just hear it blanket referred to as someone playing in the CHL. That just means they're playing in one of these three leagues. And while major junior fans all across North America might have arguments as to which of the three leagues is the best at any given time, often depending on what team they cheer for, the best players can come from any one of these three leagues, and in the end, they're notable because over half of NHL players come from one of these three CHL leagues. Three CHL leagues all share the same rules, including the age range requirement that players must be 16 to 20 years old, with limited exceptions that we won't bother getting into. All three leagues play 68 game regular seasons and have 16 team playoffs, with the difference being the number of teams that actually play in each league, with 20 teams in the OHL, 22 in the WHL, and 18 in the QMJHL as of the summer of 2024 when I'm recording this. And while each of the three leagues do have their own playoffs that results in their own champion and each has their own kind of Stanley Cup looking trophy that goes along with it, the grand prize in the CHL is the Memorial Cup, which is fought for between the three winners of each of the leagues as well as the host city in any given year. And sure, it might seem a bit odd that the host team just gets to go right to the Final Four for just being the host of the whole thing, but I guess it makes some sense. You just have that host team be the fourth seed, and you got a nice even four teams for a little quick tournament to determine the Memorial Cup champs, but that's not how they do it. Instead, they have a four-team round robin, with the top team out of that round robin going straight to the final, the second and third team playing a semi-final, and then the fourth team is done. So, why they have a host team in there? I don't know, I guess it's just a fun thing for the home crowd to have their team have at least a chance to get back into it after having lost earlier in those playoffs. Either way, usually the host team doesn't end up winning it, but it can happen like this last year. And also one last thing that I want to mention here about these major junior leagues in North America, including one more league that isn't part of the CHL that we'll get to here in a second. They do tend to be much higher scoring than certainly the pro leagues. The ECHL may be a little higher scoring than the AHL or the NHL, but if you're the type of person like me that likes to look up the stats of players and look at how they're progressing over time, especially on their way up to the NHL, or maybe compare players that your team is thinking about drafting or just drafted and look at players they could have drafted instead. If you're comparing a major junior player to say an NCAA player or someone coming over from Europe, it is worth noting that the Major junior players, so OHL, WHL, QMJHL, or USHL, which we'll get to here in a second, those players are likely to score quite a bit more points than their counterparts from the NCAA or, again, those leagues over in Europe. I mean, even aside from the fact that the players that are getting drafted out of these leagues are obviously the best players in them, which is going to inflate the stats you're likely to look at a little bit more than if you're just looking at the average player from the league, the teams in these leagues are scoring a half to almost a goal more per game than teams in the NHL, and that's just over this last season where the NHL over the last two years has seen a noticeable increase in scoring just in its own right. And while a half to a goal per game might not seem like a lot, that is a goal per game per team. So it definitely adds up over the course of a full season, especially when it's more concentrated towards the top and towards those players that are getting drafted whose stats you're going to look at. 
Anyway, just maybe something to keep in mind if you do like looking at stats, but we can move on to the next league, which, like I said, is pretty similar in all those ways to the CHL leagues in the USHL or the United States Hockey League, which is a league made up of 16 teams scattered all across the northern Midwest, but somehow no teams in the state of hockey, Minnesota. Regardless of that oddity, the USHL, which like I said is a 16 team league, was founded in 1947. Originally a semi-pro league, it became a major junior league in 1979 for the 1979-80 season, which also was the first year of the Clark Cup which is the trophy that is given out to the winner of the playoffs of the USHL every year. They also have the Anderson Cup for the winner of the regular season, the best record. But obviously the Clark Cup is the grand prize that everyone wants at the end of the season. And of course, with it too being a junior league, just like the CHL leagues, the USHL also has an age range, a pretty similar one, 16 to 21. So slightly bigger there on the older end. But unlike the CHL, which does give some stipends to its players, the USHL doesn't pay its players in any way whatsoever, which then does allow the older players to be eligible for the NCAA and play college hockey. Obviously that doesn't do much for the 16 and 17 year olds who aren't going to be old enough for college anyway, but that's there. As far as other junior leagues go that might be relevant if you're say watching an NHL draft for example, there's also the US National Team Development Program, either called the USDP or NTDP, which is, as the name might suggest, not so much a junior league or a league of any kind, so much as it is, again as it says in the name, a development program for the US national team. They go and play international tournaments throughout the year at different age levels, or maybe a higher age level if a player is good enough to move up. And then once they get old enough, a lot of these players, whether or not they get drafted, end up moving on to play NCAA hockey. And that then neatly brings us to the NCAA university hockey, college hockey, whatever you want to call it, it's players playing for their school's team while they go to college or university. It's similar to NCAA football or NCAA basketball if you're used to either of those. There's just fewer schools that have an official team with the NCAA for a variety of reasons that make sense. Access to facilities, popularity of sport, general climate of the region, whatever you want to call it, there are fewer teams, but like both basketball and football, there are also a small handful of teams that tend to be the best year in, year out, and they're not always necessarily the same schools that are good at football or basketball. Though, Michigan, and there's a few schools that do fit that bill. Like I said, it's pretty much the same as any other NCAA sport. It's run by the same governing body, so these players aren't going to make any money for any of the games they play. Obviously, they now can potentially make some money off their likeness if they can find a sponsorship deal or something like that. I don't really know how that works, but it, again, similar to all the other NCAA sports, there's a tournament at the end of the year, which, more similar to basketball, there are a fair number of teams that get into it, not quite as big as March Madness, but it all boils down to the Frozen Four, which is what draws the most attention, at least in the hockey world anyway, and then any players that could potentially get drafted out of it, usually they'll get drafted after their freshman year into the NHL, and then they can play, I don't know, the rest of a couple more years in college, or up until they sign their first pro deal, at which point they're no longer eligible for the NCAA and have to go play in the AHL or NHL, wherever their pro team that drafted their rights feels they're ready to play. With that though, and not wanting to get into too much unnecessary detail with the NCAA that we didn't get into with any of the other leagues, I think it's time that we finally do move on from all these junior or age restricted in some way leagues in North America and actually move on from North America entirely and move over to Europe where there are a few very good pro leagues, like I mentioned before, that also can have players drafted out of them into the NHL or NHL pipeline. Again, trying to tie this all back to where NHL players do come from or maybe go to after they're done in the NHL. And that can be the case with some of these pro leagues over in Europe starting with the Swedish Elite League, the best league in Sweden, the SHL. Founded in 1975, the SHL, or Swedish Hockey League, like I said, the best hockey league in Sweden, currently consists of 14 different teams, with a little bit of a twist that these might not always be the same 14 teams, because they, like some other sports across Europe, do have promotion and demotion to the second league in Sweden, the second hockey league in Sweden. It would be a little weird if they demoted to a different sport. But the lowest ranking team in the SHL, or actually not necessarily the lowest ranking team, is they do have a best of seven tournament at the end of the season between the two worst teams with the winner staying in the SHL and the loser getting demoted. Well, the best team from that second league gets promoted into their spot and the next season happens and 
you keep going from there. But aside from the promotion and demotion aspect of the SHL, which honestly I think is a great part of European sports in general, that I kind of wish there was some way to institute in North American sports. It'd be very complicated and some billionaires would be very unhappy if their team ended up getting demoted to a lower league and didn't get the TV payouts and all that, so it probably will never happen, but I think it's kind of neat. At the top of the SHL, the best teams still play in a playoff to determine a champion like any of the other European or hockey leagues in general. And then at the end of the season, the IAHF picks the best teams from across Europe and the European Pro Leagues to play in the CHL tournament, which has nothing to do with the CHL, the Canadian Hockey League junior teams that we just talked about. So it's not like we've got pro teams from Europe coming over to play for the Memorial Cup and against junior teams from North America. Completely different CHL. This one standing for Champions Hockey League, which is a league that is comprised of different teams every season, depending on who the best teams across Europe are that then play in the playoffs for the ultimate European title. A few other things of note with the SHL before we move on as we do move through this pretty quickly that are also going to be true of these other European leagues. They do play on a slightly different sized ice surface than what you would see in any North American hockey, certainly the NHL, AHL, or any of the other leagues we've covered to this point. As all the European leagues use the international ice hockey surface standard, which is four meters wider and one meter shorter than the NHL surface standard, which is what we see throughout North America and obviously in the NHL. Not necessarily something you'd be unaccustomed to seeing though, as this is the same standard that's used in the Olympics, the wider one, the international one which is the standard set by the IAHF, the governing body over international hockey. And then the other big difference that you might notice when watching European pro hockey versus North American pro hockey is that there are ads plastered all over the ice and especially all over the players, whether it's their jersey, pants, even helmet. There's ads absolutely everywhere, which is kind of the basis or end game fears of many NHL fans for why they're not a big fan of, say, the helmet ads or jersey ads that have been added into the NHL here over the last few years. Still, the NHL has a long way to go before they get to being the moving billboards that are European hockey players. As for the differences on the ice with European or international hockey versus what you would see in, say, the NHL or maybe AHL, it does tend to be a slightly less violent game. Maybe not necessarily with the hits, though. I think there probably still is more hitting happening in the NHL than those leagues, partially because of the smaller ice surface in the NHL, but also the reputation of the NHL has always been a harder hitting, more violent game. But certainly when it comes to fights, where in international hockey, fights are straight out not allowed, banned like they are in pretty much any other North American sport, but for whatever reason have always been a part of hockey and seen as a core part of the game that you could not possibly get rid of without completely changing hockey. An argument that I don't quite understand myself, but it seems like it's always going to be a part of North American hockey while it isn't a part of international hockey. And finally, as far as scoring is concerned, since we've been looking at the comparables there league to league, the European leagues do tend to have a little bit less scoring than the NHL and AHL, which is significantly less than the junior leagues over in North America, but a smaller gap tending to score around a quarter of a goal less per game than NHL teams, at least in these last couple of seasons anyway. It probably has something to do, I would imagine, with the larger playing surface, just more places for the puck to move around and less dangerous spots for the puck to be shot from. For whatever reason though, European leagues do tend to score a little bit less than the North American Pro Leagues. If you're comparing, say, a player that's about to get drafted from one of the CHL teams or one of the junior leagues over in North America to a player of a similar age playing in one of the pro leagues over in Europe, especially one of the top pro leagues, that scoring difference is going to be even more exaggerated, not only because, well, the player playing in the juniors over in North America is playing against all teenagers roughly their same age. Meanwhile, the teenager in Europe is playing against the best players that Europe has to offer that aren't already playing in the pro leagues in North America, but also because there tends to be a, a bit of a reputation that some of these pro leagues in Europe have for not playing their talented young players quite as much, whether that's a biased against younger players and allowing the veterans to get their ice time while the younger players just have to pay their dues, or if it has to do with some of these leagues not wanting to spend the time and energy on a talented young player that they know is just going to go spend their entire pro career in North America and not spend it in their league. But anyway, all that rambling is basically just to say that if you are comparing prospects, 
for, I don't know, say an NHL draft, for example, and you've got one player who's scored, I don't know, 120 points in 60 games in the WHL versus another who's scored 20 points in 40 games or something like that in the SHL, and they're drafted around the same spot. Again, I'm throwing out random numbers here, but basically the point is it's not necessarily that the player that's played in the WHL is that much better of an offensive player than the guy that just scored way fewer points in the SHL. It's just that there are some significant differences, not only in competition level, but probably the role that that player is playing on their given team. Moving on from that whole tangent, though, and getting back to the actual pro leagues over in Europe, up next we have potentially the best European pro league at the moment, depending on where the KHL is. It's kind of hard to tell with anything in Russia these days for obvious reasons. But the Finnish Elite League, which is often known as just Liga, is probably that best pro league in Europe. Also founded in 1975, Liga, the top league over in Finland, is currently a 16-team league that plays a 60-game season, and like the SHL, the Swedish league next door, they too have relegation for the bottom team in their league, moving down to the next tier pro league in Finland, and then the top team moving up into Liga the following season. And they too, while they have their own tournament and champion every season, they also send their best teams, depending on the strength of teams determined by the IIHF, to that champion hockey league that determines the best team in Europe at the end of every year. Also a couple of other fun things about Liga that are unique to them, they have this fun thing where the leading scorer of each team wears a golden helmet and nobody else wears it, so one guy out on the ice is skating around with a golden helmet, or I guess two guys, one from each team. Not like the Golden Knights where they all have golden chrome helmets, just one guy from each team. Which I don't know if those are necessarily things I'd like to see in the NHL, but it is kind of fun. Up next we have the Czech Extra Liga, which is the top Czech league. Founded in 1993, it currently consists of 14 teams that play a 52-game season. And if you've ever watched any European hockey or seen pictures of their players and you think the ads are out of control, this is the only league that I'm aware of, at least as far as the top pro leagues, that has an ad as part of the league's logo. So yeah, it's definitely a bit out of control. And once again, like the two before them, they too send teams to that Champions Hockey League at the end of the season. And then finally rounding things out as far as the leagues that we're going to go over in this video, there are some other ones across Europe, some top pro leagues. And, but as far as players that end up coming over to the NHL, the vast majority of them do come from the ones that we've mentioned. And the last one of those, which was long seen as the second best league in the world to the NHL, though that has maybe changed here in the last couple of years for obvious geopolitical reasons, it is the Continental Hockey League, or the KHL, the top league in Russia, which now for a couple of years has been kind of isolated to itself in Russia, and some of those top players have found their ways to other leagues. But nonetheless, regardless of where it's located and any issues that might come up as a result of that, at least in the current state of the world, there's no denying the fact that the KHL right now is one of the most talented leagues in the world and still produces some very, very good talent that does find its way into the NHL draft, and a lot of players find their way over to the NHL. Even aside from that, the players that still play in it are very good in their own right. It is, in its current state, a league that was founded in 2008, currently consisting of 23 teams, a team even in China, one in Kazakhstan, and another in Belarus. And these 23 teams do play a 68-game season, which does make it the longest regular season of any of the European pro leagues, and puts it right on par with the major junior leagues over in North America as far as length of regular season. And finally, I suppose I should also mention that all of these countries I just mentioned that have their pro leagues, Finland, Czechia, Russia, and Sweden all also have their own junior leagues and some form of minor leagues. Like I said, with Finland and Sweden, both of them have the promotion and demotion to the lower league. They also have junior leagues, like I just said. Russia has the Junior League, the MHL, and the VHL is their secondary league or their minor league, but there are some built in there, so there's possibility that players could get drafted out of lower leagues but still play if they continue to play in their country before coming to the NHL, if they're not quite NHL ready, like most players in the draft are not quite NHL ready right away, they are likely to stay in whatever their home country is and work their way up to the pro league before eventually coming over to North America to play in the AHL or maybe in a junior league if they're still young enough when the club that drafted them wants to try and bring them over to North America to get used to the North American game. Which is, like I said, a little bit different because of the ice surface and some other things, but anyway. So with all of that having been said, this has been 
at least a lot of recording. I don't know how long the video is going to end up being, but based on the amount of recording, it could be a pretty long one. And like I said, especially in Europe, there are a lot of other leagues that I didn't have the time to get to. And just based on the number of players that come from those leagues to end up in the NHL, it just for the reason of the video didn't make a lot of sense to do so, but I might go and make single videos about each of these leagues. So if there are things that you think I left out, which I left a lot out about pretty much all of these leagues that you'd like to mention down in the comment section, please feel free to do so. And real quick, before we close things out here, there is one other league that I wanted to mention here at the end, and that is the PWHL, the Professional Women's Hockey League in North America that's brand new here as of just this last season, and it had a fantastic first season. I think far exceeding the expectations that anybody really had for it as far as the popularity of the league. And a lot of that, I think, can be attributed to the fact that they did a lot of things very well that the NHL honestly could learn from, especially when it comes to how accessible they made their games to watch, putting a lot of them free to watch on YouTube, if not all of them. So yeah, just some very cool ideas that the NHL could learn from in spite of how much dragging the feet the NHL has done on just associating itself with the PWHL. But yeah, great to see that that league is off to the races and got off to a great start. Anyway, with that, again, the scope of this video was to give you an idea of where players that eventually end up in the NHL come from or might play after the team drafts them in the original draft to send them back to a junior league, back to a European league, or eventually bring them up through the ECHL and AHL before hopefully finding their way to the NHL. At least now you have a slightly better idea of what the structure of hockey looks like and how those players find their way to that best league in the world of the NHL. Again, if there's any leagues that you felt like I should have mentioned that I left out, please leave those down in the comment section below. And if you'd like to see more full in-depth videos about the histories and just these other leagues in general, let me know about that down below and maybe I'll get to that here sometime in the future, maybe this off season or there's going to be plenty of off seasons to come where I can throw some of those videos up. Until then, though, if you have made it to this point, thank you very much for watching. If you did like or enjoy the video, there are buttons for that kind of stuff down below. Help support the channel, so I'd appreciate you using them. Until next time, stay safe out there, be good to each other, and God bless.